When we solve for forces, very often we know something about the acceleration. If we can express this thing about the acceleration in a mathematical sense, that's what we call an acceleration constraint. So we're going to start with some easy acceleration constraints and go through a good list of them in this video. So one thing is that if we're told the object is in equilibrium, and right, what we should remember is if we're also told it's in constant velocity, that is a type of equilibrium. So we're just going to have that also here. Our statement of equilibrium or a statement of constant velocity is that the object is not changing velocity. It's not accelerating. So then if we have that, then our acceleration constraints, what we can state mathematically is we can state that the acceleration in the x is 0, the acceleration in the y is 0. Or any in just general sense, we can say the acceleration is 0 at all. So that's our first acceleration constraint that we're going to be using when we're learning about this stuff. After that, we can say that if we're on a surface, then as long as our object is on a surface, it can't fall below and it can't lift above the surface. It has to stay right moving with the surface in contact with the surface. And our surfaces are generally assumed not to move. So if we move on a surface, then our acceleration perpendicular to the surface is equal to zero. So if we have a horizontal surface, very often the case, then right, the perpendicular direction is the y direction. We can say then acceleration of the y is 0 if we're on a perpendicular surface, uh, a horizontal surface. But in a general sense, we can say the acceleration perpendicular is 0. Or if we're just told the acceleration, then we can also just have an equation for the acceleration. So that can be another acceleration constraint, but we don't have enough to really put anything fun on the board with that. Lastly, if we have two objects with linked motion, so we'll see this when we're talking about Newton's third law, interactions, and things like that. Very often we'll have that, right, the magnitude of acceleration is equal to the magnitude of acceleration. And there might be some pluses and minuses and things like that. So we might say A1 is equal to plus minus a2 in some sort of way. So this is where we really need kind of an art and a little bit of skill in order to figure out how the two objects link in motion. And so we need a little bit of time with that. We'll talk a lot more about that when we get to Newton's third laws. We do have one other type of motion that we can talk about, and that is circular motion. So with our circular motion, we want to draw the circular motion in two different ways. So here I have, right, my object is moving around in this way. And very often we'll call this kind of the right circle view. But we can also view it in this side view. And as we have circular motion, right, in this circle view, in the side view, if we're moving in a circle, we don't want to be using x, y, and z. We want to be using r, t, and z. So we're going to start talking about what we can say about acceleration in the r, acceleration in the t, and acceleration in the z. So it's actually kind of nice to go from down to up. Acceleration in the z, so we'll look at this. In this side view, this direction is the z direction, and then moving away from the circle is in the r direction. In this circle view, right, we have moving away from the circle is in the r direction, and then along this is the tangential direction. Over here, still the tangential direction. This is the r direction. What we can see is that we're moving along, right, keeping our radius the same and moving along in the tangential direction. Over in the side view, we can see we have no motion in the z direction. If we have no motion in the z direction, then our acceleration in the z direction must also be zero. So our az is equal to zero. For our acceleration in the tangential direction, we have an old memory, hopefully, 
of our definition of AT and our definition of alpha, we're not going to deal with it very often in this chapter, but just in case we have to do this, right? Alpha is zero if we have uniform circular motion. So hopefully we've jogged a little bit of memories with alpha and our kind of relationship between acceleration and tangential direction and our alpha, because now it's time to come to the important one, acceleration in the radial direction. As we are moving in this, we are going to need an acceleration in this direction in order to keep us moving, right? Over here, we can kind of see it's moving towards the center of the circle. So it's in the negative r direction, and it's our centripetal acceleration. So our centripetal acceleration is going to be negative r omega squared or negative v squared over r. Different books will have, right, whether this plus sign or minus sign is there. Don't worry too much about the sign and conventions until you really get yourself into the weeds of a problem. Know that, right, your net acceleration does need to be towards the center of the circle. And whether you define your r as a way or towards the center, we'll choose whether you have the pluses or minuses. So with this and all of these, these are our acceleration constraints. These are going to add, right, answers to a lot of different equations, and they're going to give us the number of answers and the reduce the number of equations such that we can solve a lot of these problems. If we don't have these acceleration constraints, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So make sure you have these acceleration constraints when you're writing your problems, when you're solving them.